appreciation day today for the presence of all of you that are here. We're especially grateful to have Brother Hugh Fulford with us. We had an excellent lesson in the Bible class this morning. We're looking forward to a um, great number of good lessons in the meeting. And I'm sure that you'll be glad that you are here. And we hope that you'll be planning to invite others to come back from service to service. Brother Fulford began preaching when he was 15 years of age. He has preached in Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Texas on a full-time basis. Presently is engaged in gospel meetings and lectureships and things of that nature. And does a great deal of writing. He is an excellent writer. We're in an age when there's a lot of uncertainty from many pulpits in the brotherhood. And I especially appreciate the sound scriptural teaching that is characteristic of Brother Fulford's, of his writing and of his preaching. And I'm sure that uh, there's nothing really that we could say that would be more uh, complimentary than to say that he is a sound, faithful preacher of the gospel. We look forward to the lesson today and tonight, and we hope that you'll be here from time to time. Brother Fulford, we're so happy to have you at this time. Well, thank you, Brother Bob McAnally, for those very gracious words. And I am honored to be here, to be at South Florida Avenue Church in Lakeland, Florida. I appreciate the elders' invitation to come and to be with you. And I am anticipating that we shall have a very good and a very successful meeting. I will try to do my part as the speaker the song leaders will do their part as the leaders of our worship and song. And you can do your part by being faithful to attend the services of the meeting and then to invite friends and neighbors, relatives, work associates, and other people that you have the opportunity to tell about this meeting and the effort that is being put forth. I look forward to the next several days of Christian fellowship with you. <coughs> Throughout the years, faithful gospel preachers have often emphasized what is known as the possibility of apostasy. The possibility of falling away from the Lord and becoming unfaithful. This has been a needed emphasis, an important emphasis, because the Bible teaches that one can depart from the truth one can fall away from the Lord. One can become unfaithful. The wise man Solomon said in Proverbs 16, 18, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. When we are proud and haughty in our attitudes, we are setting ourselves up for a fall. And that is true not only in matters of a physical and material nature, but it is especially true in the realm of spiritual matters. Paul wrote to the Corinthian Christians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, and said, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Now that warning would be absolutely meaningless and unnecessary if it were not possible for a Christian to fall, to fall away from the Lord. Similarly in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, the inspired writer said, Take 
Heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in falling away from the living God. One cannot fall away from something or someone with whom he is not in contact or relationship. One cannot fall away from God if he has never been in fellowship with God. And so the writer says that we need to take heed lest there be in any of us, any of us, an evil heart of unbelief in falling away from the living God. And so I repeat, this has been an important and necessary emphasis to be reminded, to be warned of the possibility of becoming unfaithful to the Lord. And all we have to do is look around and we can see many who once were faithful to the Lord, but now they are unfaithful. That's true of individuals. It's true of congregations as a whole. But in addition to the emphasis that we've given to the possibility of falling away is the importance of giving emphasis to the fact that we can have assurance and confidence of our standing with the Lord. We, as God's people, need to be encouraged. We need to be lifted up. We need to be reminded that there is solid ground upon which we can stand with blessed assurance and a firm confidence in our relationship to the Lord. And I want to begin this gospel meeting today, at least from the standpoint of the first sermon in the meeting, by reminding us of the solid foundation upon which we can have such blessed assurance. Now, I sometimes illustrate what I'm talking about by saying that this is a foundation with five layers of solid stone constituting the foundation. Or I sometimes illustrate it by saying there are five planks in this solid platform upon which we can stand with confidence, with hope, and with blessed assurance. So this morning, whether in your mind you think of the five things that I am going to mention as being layers of stone that are built upon each other constituting a foundation, or if you think of them as five planks that are laid out side by side to constitute a platform, Think with me about the reasons why we can have blessed assurance. The first reason that we can have confidence of our standing before the Lord is because of the unfailing love of God. We need to think often about God's love for us. In many respects, it is the theme of the Bible. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans chapter 8 is one of the great chapters of the Bible. And when we come down to verse 31 of Romans chapter 8, we find the great apostle Paul saying, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, 
Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How long has it been since we read that passage? How long has it been since we deeply reflected upon what the apostle is saying there? It does not change what we pointed out at the beginning of our message. It does not change the fact that we of ourselves can decide to depart from God. But it reminds us of all that we have going for us. It reminds us of God's unfailing love for us. And it constitutes one of those bedrock ledges. One of those sure solid planks in the platform upon which we can stand before God with blessed assurance. Jude tells us in verse 21 of his one chapter letter, keep yourselves in the love of God. Don't we want to do that? Since God has loved us as he has, do we not want to show our love for him and do we not want to keep ourselves in the love of God? This is one of the bases, one of the planks and the platform, if you please, of our blessed assurance. Now come with me to the passage that was read a few moments ago. The second reason that we have for having confidence and assurance of our standing before God and our acceptance by Him in spite of our human weaknesses and frailties is the blood of Jesus Christ. John writes in second, uh, excuse me, 1 John chapter 1 beginning in verse 5 and says, and this is the message which we have heard from him, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, 
we make him a liar and his truth is not in us. What does this passage tell us? It tells us that as long as we are walking in the light of God's love, in the light of God's word, in the light of God's truth, that the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on working to cleanse us of our sins. We as Christians make mistakes. We're not sinlessly perfect. We stumble. We fall. But the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing us. Of course, involved in walking in the light is recognizing our sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar. He's directing those words to Christians. We need to understand that we sin. But as long as our mindset, as long as our heart's desire is to walk in the light and to please Him, God, then the blood of Jesus Christ, literally we're told by the Greek scholars, keeps on cleansing us from our sins, keeps on working in our behalf so that our sins are remitted. We're cleansed of our sins. And that is a beautiful blessing that we have in Christ to know that as we walk in the light, even when we stumble and fall and make mistakes and sin, the blood of Christ is constantly working in our behalf to keep us cleansed and therefore to fill our hearts with wonderful and blessed assurance. There is a third thing that contributes to our blessed assurance. And that is what I call the earnest of the Spirit. I'll say a little more about that term earnest in just a moment. It's a term that we use in a very limited sense today, but in the King James Version of 1611, it is used quite frequently in connection with something that the Holy Spirit serves as in our lives as Christians. But I want to introduce this line of thought by calling our attention to a passage in the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. In verses 3 through 14 of Ephesians chapter 1, we have in the original Greek language one long continuous sentence. In the American Standard Version of the New Testament, that one long continuous sentence is respected. There is no period from the beginning of verse 3 until you get to the end of verse four, uh, 14 in the American Standard Version. The King James Version, the New King James Version, and other later translations, English versions, break that long sentence up into more manageable parts, so to speak. So that in verses 3 through 6, we have a statement about what God the Father has done for us. In verses 7 through 12, what we have in Christ Jesus. And in verses 13 and 14, what the Holy Spirit does for us. And it's in those last two verses, or it is to those last two verses, that I now want to call our attention. Paul writes in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 and says, In Him, that is, in Christ, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, 
you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of God who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise, uh, 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 until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory in Christ Jesus. Paul emphasizes in these two verses two things that the Holy Spirit does for us as Christians. First, he says that the Holy Spirit serves as a seal that we are God's child. The word seal here is used in the sense of a mark or a sign that is put on a person. As ranchers, cattle farmers, used to put a mark on their cattle to identify them. So it is that when we obey the gospel and become a Christian, God marks us, if you please. He labels us. He puts his sign on us. He puts his seal on us. He gives us his Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit serves as a sign or a seal of our sonship. It's not outward. It's not physical. It's not something that can be seen with the fleshly eyes. But it is God's spiritual mark on us. Secondly, in this passage, Paul says that the Holy Spirit serves as the guarantee or as the deposit of our eternal inheritance. And that's where I want to come back now to that word that's used in the King James Version, the earnest of the Spirit. A person goes out here to buy a house or a piece of land, and the seller says, well, if you really want to buy this piece of property, I need some earnest money. Now, we all know what that means. That means that the buyer is to put down some money in good faith on the fact that he is going to carry through and make that purchase. When we became a Christian, God gave us, so to speak, a down payment on our eternal inheritance. He gave us, if you please, an earnest of our everlasting home. We ought not to want to renege on that. We ought not to want to forfeit the earnest or the deposit, the down payment that God has given to us by the gift of the Holy Spirit on our eternal home in heaven. And because God has given to us His Holy Spirit as the seal of our sonship and as a deposit on our eternal inheritance, we can stand with confidence before Him and our hearts can be filled with blessed assurance. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6 and said, And because you are sons, notice that, not to make you sons, not to make you children, but because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, that fills our hearts with blessed assurance. Later in the book of Ephesians, Paul will write in chapter 4 and verse 30 and say, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. God sealed us by giving us His Holy Spirit. He did that 
in order that we might have confidence before him, in order that we might have assurance before him, in order that we could look forward to the day of our eternal redemption. Now we need to understand that this gift of the Holy Spirit for us is not of a miraculous nature. It doesn't inspire us to receive revelation from God and to communicate revelation as it did with the apostles and prophets of New Testament times. It doesn't enable us to speak in tongues, to work miracles, to heal the sick or to raise the dead. But there is a non-miraculous indwelling of the Holy Spirit and God gives His Spirit to every child of His as a seal that that person is His child, as a mark that that person is His child, and as an earnest, as a deposit, as a guarantee of our eternal inheritance. And so we can stand with confidence before the Lord. The fourth thing that enters into our blessed assurance is the promise and the power of the Word of God itself. James wrote in chapter 1, verse 21, and he said, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. The word of God, powerful, able to save our soul. How we do need to read it. How we need to study it. How we need to lay it up in our hearts how it needs to guide us and mold our every attitude, our every action. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. In that great stirring speech that Paul delivered to the elders of the church at Ephesus when he gathered them to himself in the little city, uh, little seacoast city of Miletus as recorded in Acts chapter 20. He delivered to them what I consider one of the most heart-touching, heart-rending speeches in all of the New Testament. And when he gets to the end of it, he says, speaking to those elders, and now brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. God's word fills our souls with confidence, with blessed assurance. And then finally, the basis of our assurance rests upon our own continued faithfulness. Yes, in order to have blessed assurance, in order for our hearts to be filled with confidence of our standing before God, we have a responsibility in this matter. The Apostle Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, and he said, But also for this very reason, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you neither to be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he who lacks these things is blind, cannot see afar off, 
and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, give the more diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our faithfulness contributes to our blessed assurance. Not our sinless perfection. We've already noted that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So it's not our sinless perfection perfection, but it is our faithfulness. To the tribulation-torn saints of Smyrna, Jesus said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And that's the responsibility that you and I also have. So now think about it. Can I have confidence in my standing before the Lord? Can my heart be filled with the blessed assurance that I am in a right relationship with God? Yes, I can. Based on the unfailing love of God, the constant cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ, the earnest of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Word of God, and my own continued faithfulness, I can have blessed assurance. <coughs> what about you this morning? Do you have that blessed assurance? Do you have confidence that if you were to die today, all would be well with your soul? Can you honestly say that you are in a right relationship with God? Have you come to faith in Christ as God's Son? Have you turned from your sins in repentance? Have you confessed your faith in Christ? Have you ever been baptized, immersed in water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins? If you have not done those things, you cannot possibly be in a right relationship with God because those are the conditions that are necessary for one to meet in order to enter a right relationship. Having done that, have you remained faithful to the Lord? If you're here this morning having never confessed faith in Christ and been baptized into Him for the remission of your sins, we're pleading with you, we're begging you to do that. And if you're here this morning and you're unfaithful to the Lord, and therefore without blessed assurance, we're pleading with you to come, to come back to the Lord, back to the church, back to His people. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? If not, will you come to Him while together we stand and sing? Uh, beautiful.